Glenn Hutchins is no stranger to power. He's a private equity pioneer, a former presidential economic advisor, and a Federal Reserve board member. He's also part owner of the Boston Celtics. A first big splash was in 1999 when he co-founded private equity firm Silver Lake Partners. Today, his former company has $45 billion under management with investments in Tesla, Dell, Alibaba, along with other tech giants. Hutchins has turned his attention to the world of fintech, along with many other projects, and he shares his story with me now. Hello everyone, I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to Influencers. Welcome to our first guest, Glenn Hutchins. Glenn, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Andy. Great to be with you. So there's so much to talk about, but I want to start off with the stock market, which is wild and crazy these days. Maybe can't figure out what's going on with the economy. Glenn, what's your take on both of those subjects? Well, only uh, fools predict interest rates, equity prices, uh, oil prices and elections. So I'm not going to do any of those today, right? Uh, but uh, what's going on with the equity markets? I think in a, in a very distilled way, the two major foundational elements, monetary policy and fiscal policy, are right now both stimulative, right? Monetary policy, uh, what, what I mean by stimulative, are both pointing toward higher interest rates. So monetary policy is in the process of a big regime change from lower for longer to normalization which means the, ba the balance sheet's reducing, interest rates are going up, and that's influencing the equity markets. Fiscal policy on top of that has added a huge amount of new financing demands because it's a borrow and spend plan. So the borrowing roughly about $1.5 trillion over 10 years to finance this, that's increasing interest rates. So those two major influences are driving interest rates up, and interest rates are bad for equities, right? Uh, and so that's the major thing to think about. Then you layer on top of that all of the issues and uncertainties associated with increasing the dollar, which is one another the secondary effect of interest rates, which causes a reduction in U.S. exports. Um, the, uh, the consequent slowdown in growth of the company, countries that export to the United States, including but not only China. Uh, and then geopolitical uncertainty associated with things like but not only the tariffs. And it's no surprise that the, that the markets are unusually volatile at this moment. Um, you asked about the economy. We can go, o overall, the markets, one of the things people don't understand is they say, well, the economy's strong, what, what is the market saying? You have to understand that economic uh, uh, data is backward looking. The growth for the fourth quarter was X. The markets don't care about that. What the markets care about is what the growth for the coming year is. So the markets are forecasting while the uh, economic data looks backward. So the markets are clearly forecasting a set of economic problems over the course of the coming year um, that uh, are, are nervous making. The biggest piece of that is that the hugely stimulative fiscal policy of the last year with that ill-considered tax cut was a one-time thing. So that's now in the base and that's not going anywhere. Uh, and then you add to that the issues we talked about plus the question of uh, how long can this recovery last uh, and the markets seem to be forecasting some weakness for the coming year. So are you more concerned with tougher comps in 2019 or the actual possibility of a recession? Or neither? Well, yeah, as I say, um, I'm not going to be a fool to try to get into the level of forecasting. <laughs> right. But I think the coming year has uh, a, well, the, 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 to the extent that we have to disaggregate the economy and the marketplace. To the extent that we've got a, had a problem over the last year, almost exactly a year ago, I was warning people that I thought asset prices had gotten to be too high and volatility was too muted. Of course, over the course of this past year, I think we solved that problem, um, at least the volatility element of it. But the, um, if there is a problem in the economy in the coming year, it will be caused by one of, or both of two things. One is some slowdown of corporate activity, uh, and the other would be some increase in interest rates that brings equity prices down even further. It feels to me, if there is a problem like that, it feels to me more like what happened in 2000 and 2001, where there would be a correction of equity prices and maybe a small wealth effect associated with that, but then a pretty quick recovery from it, as opposed to something like 2008, where there was a huge debt burden that weighed on the economy for 10 years. 
Let's talk about the tech sector specifically, Glenn. And you said that that this sector grows faster than the economy, so it's sort of the investment thesis of your lifetime. But is that still the case in all the problems we're hearing about social media and possible government regulation? What's your take on the business these days? Well, that's good. Good, good question. So let's disaggregate that into a couple of things. There's a public policy issue out there, which is around the whole set of privacy questions and net neutrality questions that we've dealt with over the last couple of years. The people who think about these things tell me there'll almost certainly be some form of legislation of that this year. Um, my view is that um, could turn out to be a very good thing because it removes the uncertainty associated with that and then allows those companies to reset and get back to growth again. So I think that's probably a necessary thing and it's not unlike what happened to IBM at the end of its rapid growth phase and Microsoft at the end of its rapid, rapid growth phase. You know, the Facebook, Twitter, Googles are kind of in that same kind of period where they're subject to regulatory scrutiny. That's just that's public policy issue to create some uncertainty. But with respect to the technology economy, um, if you had bought the major tech winners, the FANG group, uh, at their peak price in each of, in before each of the, the internet bubble and the, before the great financial crisis and held, you would have made a large amount of money. Look at Amazon, for instance. Amazon didn't get back to its price in 1999 until 2007. But today, that 2007 price is a fraction of where it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, so. If you, buy a, if, you, if you invest in a great company and own it for a very long period of time, you're going to do just fine. Let's switch over to Washington a little bit. Um, do we have to? Yes, we do. A couple of questions here, Glenn. So what is your take on how President Trump is handling the economy to the extent that he oversees it? And what is the best way for a chief executive to handle Trump, a, a Trump policy, if you will? Look, I think the economic policies of this administration have been... Um, irresponsible to the point of dangerous. Um, the uh, tax cut was a huge error, in my view. Uh, it, uh, I was all for tax reform. Uh, I think that, however, cutting uh, taxes uh, and not paying for it, uh, debt financing a tax cut, it used to be the Democrats were held to be irresponsible because they were for tax and spend. What the, right. what the Republicans have done in this administration is borrow and spend. They haven't even had the intellectual honesty of actually raising the taxes to pay for their spending. Uh, they have, there's some sort of myth out there that the tax cut's gonna pay for itself. It obviously hasn't. We have, largest, we have the largest deficits during a recovery in American history, even as a percent of GDP. Uh, so we're just borrowing a huge amount of money. That's gonna put a massive amount of pressure on the, uh, on the interest, interest rates in equity markets, as we talked about in the past. The, um, do, the, the trade policies are remarkably um, ill-advised, uh, going after our allies in Canada and Mexico the way they did. And I know that's behind us now, but that was extraordinarily ill-advised. The tariffs are hurting on China, are hurting American manufacturers more than hurting the Chinese. Uh, do we need to uh, uh, adjust our relationship with China on, around areas like intellectual property policy and technology policy, of course. How do you do that? You do that by getting China's trading partners to negotiate with them as a bloc. What was that called? That was called TPP. The, um, the, uh, the Trump administration's actions to withdraw from TPP without extracting any concession from China was a huge blunder. Uh, the, there's an opportunity out there right now, but the way we manage our allies, I think it's going to very, be a very tough thing to do, which is to turn TPP into a negotiating block with China and really go after these problems in a, in a way that can fix them. They're not doing that. The third is we have a set of, and Republicans used to recoil from industrial policy. A government can't pick winners, but we are picking winners. We're picking the coal industry, the nuclear industry, the aluminum industry, and the steel industry as our winners. Mm -hmm. Right, and while China is investing in smart infrastructure, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing, as well as solar, there are more Americans who work in the solar industry than work in the coal industry, in the United States. But we're not thinking in those terms. So I think if you go across the economic policies of this administration, um, the uh, they're uh, plainly wrongheaded. That is a list of qualms you have there, no doubt about that, Glenn. So what should the Democrats do about this? I mean, there's a wealth of candidates 
How is this going to play out as we get towards 2020? I'm not a I'm not a political prognosticator, uh -huh. uh, but I think that um, if I was a asked about the economic policy aspects of that, what I would say is we need to get back to some degree of fiscal responsibility. Uh, not increase taxes, but roll back these tax cuts to get to, to the Obama Bush level of taxes. Then try to move forward toward tax reform that makes our tax system more uh, competitive. That's kind of one. The second is that uh, I think we need to have a significant investment in our infrastructure in our economy. Um, infrastructure is a very, very tough issue because more than 90% of it occurs at the state and local level and it takes a very long time to get it done. I would advocate as a consequence of that an infrastructure bank that could, mm. at the federal level, not, not, not unlike the import-export bank, that can provide financing. Uh, and I would um, uh, focus our research and development budgets on newer technologies so that we could uh, compete with China in the future in things like AI and quantum computing. Uh, and I would put a huge amount of emphasis on getting our education system right so we could prepare the next generation for the future. Those are some of the things I would do. You served in Washington though and you know what the environment's like. It's actually much worse than when you served there a couple decades ago. How do we end this incredible bipartisanship? I mean, do you see any solution, any how realistic are those plans of yours, for instance? You know, uh, so, so um, there's this whole notion of, you know, don't waste a good crisis. Right. Um, um, do, so the question is, do we have to wait for a crisis until we can actually get it right? I would hope that uh, in, the next, in, the next, in the coming years, we could end up with an election in 2020 that would test this vision of America one that's backward looking versus one that's forward looking, one that was about investing in the future, which is one that, rather than one that was nostalgic about the past, one that's about uniting people rather than one about dividing people. If we could have that sort of discussion, uh, we could learn a lot about the country that we are. Glenn, you have funded the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. A name not created by a poet. <laughs> it rolls off the tongue. <laughs> And Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen are affiliated with that. Uh, you're close with John Williams, who is the head of the New York Fed. You're definitely a policy wonk. Um, why are you so interested in this subject? And is it right for you to be this closely involved with the Federal Reserve? Well, when, I, um, when we decided to do this uh, 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 venture at Brookings, it was my observation that monetary policy was something very few people really really understood, that it was a subject that was essentially controlled by a priesthood uh, of central bankers who worked inside heavily fortified and guarded buildings, uh, and they very seldom brought their uh, uh, the subject matter that they researched and talked about to the public for, for very good reasons, which was that they could do things like move markets. So they had to right. be very careful what they talked about. But I thought it would be a very useful thing, particularly, you have to recall, following the financial crisis when there was um, fiscal policy stalemate in Washington, the sequester and all that sort of thing, the only really powerful tool that was being used for, for economic policy was monetary policy for about 10 years. Uh, and so to have a place where monetary policy could be studied outside of a central bank, could be, the, could be debated, and where the different views could be articulated and disseminated, I thought was a very valuable thing to do for purposes of public understanding of what was going on. Do you wield too much influence? <laughs> no, I, well, first of all, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, it, there's a very important uh, uh, separation between kind of what I do and what they do. Right. Um, David Wessel, who's really the person who's put all this together, former Wall Street Journal uh, journalist of renown, um, and I have a have a trans have a have an understanding which is, the less I'm involved in it, the more successful it will be. Right. Uh, so I don't tell them what to do. I'm very seldom engaged with what they're doing. They've done a terrific job, uh, and I've just stand stood back and let a thousand flowers bloom. 
but Ben Bernanke and, and Janet Yellen are walking down the halls. What are they, what no, are they like? By the way, the, the concept that I could tell you know, Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen what to do is ludicrous in and of itself. Okay, fair enough. Right, if you know what I mean. But one of the things that we've done there is to uh, create what's called what, what I call open architecture, mm -hmm. which is what they do is they figure out what the most important issues are that need to be discussed. A good example was a few years ago, there was this concept of negative interest rates. And, what, and there were countries around the world that experimented with negative interest rates. So they found the people in the world who had practical experience and had studied it and brought them together from around the world to discuss this topic. That's not a topic that's political, that's ideological, that has a, um, uh, that where someone wields influence. It's a topic that is, you know, could, could turn out to be enormously important that there's now a repository of understanding of. Right. You also gave uh, $15 million to the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard, your alma mater. Why did you do that? Well, it's interesting. So the other piece of this is, uh, we also, by the way, called that the Hutchins Center. We did a global search for a name. <laughs> and Somehow you landed on that? Hutchins, it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. it's funny how that um, happened, right. Uh, in that case, uh, well, it's, it, they're, they're, they're similar in that it's race relations in America. Mm -hmm. Uh, is a topic that has had, um, that continues even after having an African American president to vex us, to be at the core of our, kind of who we are as a society. Uh, it is something that has attracted a, um, a relatively small amount of money. The amount of money we gave was $25 million and it was by far the largest gift ever in the field. Um, that's actually, while it's a lot of money, it's not a large amount, not a, Harvard just raised $9 billion. If you know what I mean, uh, and so the um, my point is that it's a very very important topic that hasn't had a lot of res uh, support. It's kind of one. Two is that there's a person there, uh, Henry Lewis Skip Gates, Skip Gates, who has uh, extraordinarily capable in terms of taking the understandings, the research findings in the ivory tower, and translating them into something that can be. Uh, that he can talk about as a public intellectual and that can be made accessible to people who aren't experts in the field. Um, so it's been, again, a very, very powerful uh, outcome there to kind of to create the means by which we can promote better understanding and build bridges inside this community where, like a lot of other things in, in the world in which we live today, there's too many divisions. I think people are probably getting to see the point that you have a lot of different interests so my question, Glenn, is how do you allocate your time when you get out of bed in the morning? It's funny. So people ask me, what, I, what are you doing? And I say precisely what I want to do. Uh, but the most important issue for me is to find really talented people who, with whom I can collaborate to get things done. Right? So in this case, we've talked about two people, David Wessel at the Center of Brookings, Skip Gates at the Center uh, at Harvard, um, creating the capacity for them to be successful, and then getting out of the way and letting them do it uh, is a, uh, a real gift. Uh, and so what I've tried to do is to pick spots where a small amount of invested capital and time and interest on my part can enable people like that to be successful. Crypto. By the way, it's also not too good for your golf game. Right. You can't do all this and get your golf handicap down, but that's okay. Oh, well, something has to suffer. Um, <laughs> crypto. Crypto. Uh, another one of your interests, and, right. and you've kind of uh, gotten into that, but we've just seen a huge meltdown over the past 12, 15 months. Are you are still a believer? So um, if, you would, if we'd been sitting here together in 2002, we probably were, um, mm -hmm. you, you would have asked me, the Internet. We've just seen this huge meltdown in the last 12 to 15 months. Are you still a believer? <laughs> right? Yep. Um, uh, and so the answer is yes. Uh, now the, the, the digital currency solution uh, is, the, is the most important technological advance I've seen since the internet. Uh, it has the capacity to do lots more, but it has, certainly has the capacity to enable us to move anything of value around the world at the speed of light at no cost. The, it has three components. It has a token of value, which is called the Bitcoin. It has an accounting mechanism, which is called the blockchain, 
But the most important piece, which is one that people aren't focusing on, is the protocol. The underlying protocol by which we agree to do these, to conduct these transactions. So you use a series of protocols every day and you don't even think about it. You don't think about the internet protocol, you don't think about the simple mail technology protocol, you don't think about the file transfer protocol, you don't think about the high text translation protocol. I can go through them, right? You just, you, you just make use of the technology and the protocols make it work. The people who really understand what's going on with digital currencies understand that putting these protocols in place, the blockchain protocol, the Ethereum protocol, the uh, XR, the Ripple protocol, and then enabling those protocols to cause transactions to occur. Uh, and then those, and those transactions can be defined very broadly as not just moving same things of value, but anything that's got an information content uh, is extraordinarily transformative. The focus on the value of the token is distracting and uninformative. So maybe now's a good time to invest in it. I'm investing in the companies. I have owned some of the tokens on and off, uh, um, but I'm investing in the companies that use the technology to drive this transformational change. You've also uh, invested in FinTech? Sure, yes. And, and what does that mean? What does FinTech actually mean? Well, you know, uh, I remember Ted Turner once said, I was into cable before cable was cool. Right. <laughs> I was into FinTech before FinTech was cool. Okay. NASDAQ is FinTech. Right. Bringing together financial services and technology to, to drive value to customers. So. Over the course of my business career, I helped to build the NASDAQ, I helped to build what's now called TD Ameritrade. Uh, those are both fintech companies, companies that use technology to deliver financial services. And right now I'm involved with a company that we discussed earlier called Virtu, uh, which is the world's largest electronic market maker that makes markets and securities around the world at the speed of light at less than penny spreads. Do you see changing what you're doing right now or do you like this sort of portfolio life that you have? Do you have any ideas? Do you have any, have, have a recommendation for me? Sail around the world? <laughs> no, thank you. Okay. <laughs> no, I, uh, look, I'm, I'm enjoying very much what I'm doing because I have a life where I'm able to, uh, to be engaged as an investor. I uh, am in able, I'm able to um, be involved as a philanthropist uh, and I'm be able to sort of be engaged in the public policy community. I get to play, the, and I get to play the occasional round of golf and we're hoping to um, see the Celtics get to the NBA Finals sometime in the next few years. Yeah, how's the NBA been so successful over the past decade? You know, it's interesting. So um, I think it's primarily because if I had to pick one uh, thing, I think that uh, David Stern and Adam Silver have been extraordinary as commissioners of the league. Um, they're great leaders. Uh, and by the way, one of the things a great leader does is pick a great successor. And you think about the succession from David Stern to Adam Silver, extraordinary. Um, I think that's point one. Point two is uh, the international appeal of the NBA has proved to be enormous. Uh, and so there's a big international market that's growing very much unlike, for instance, American football, which hasn't had the same kind of international uh, appeal. And which has other problems. Which too. has huge other problems. Uh, and then I would say third, the capacity to embrace and work with the players in a socially productive and constructive way so that you've got a, you don't have friction between the players in the league and the teams, but you have them all working together kind of as one uh, is way a great organization succeeds. Uh, and then I think finally the um, embrace of modern technologies for purposes of pushing the game forward uh, and making it accessible to uh, more and different kinds of customers in different kinds of ways uh, is very, has been very valuable. Now, before we started talking about basketball, I was going to ask you, if called, would you go back to Washington to serve, presumably after 2020? I don't have any plans to do that. Uh, you know, um, I'm 63 years old. There's a new generation of people that ought to be kind of... Um, a young 63. A young 63, yeah. Um, I, my goal right now over the next couple of years is going to try be able to make a contribution, find a path, to putting a, 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 to solving the huge problem we have right now uh, in Washington by trying to put leadership in place, either Democrat or Republican, that can be constructive and push our country into the next century. Uh, that's the main thing which I think I can try to work on. I'm not particularly interested in, in serving myself in that capacity. 
Let's take a look back, uh, Glenn, at Silver Lake, which you found. It's now been 20 years. You right. co-founded that 20, 20 years ago. 20 years ago this month. 1999, I remember. January 1999, yeah. 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 Why, a lot of people wondered if it would succeed, and it did. Including you. Including me. Well, I just asked questions. <laughs> That's my job, <laughs> That's right? That's your job. I get and, it. Um, I get it. But it, it was successful. It's still successful, of course. Um, you've left the company. Um, why was it so successful? How has it been so successful? Well, I think um, one uh, was that uh, we picked a, you know, they say uh, one of the tenets of modern finance is it's more about asset allocation than manager selection. Mm -hmm. I couldn't select a different manager because that was the person I saw in the mirror every morning. Right. So I had to pick the right set of assets. So I think finding a, being able to focus on technology during a period in which it had enormous growth uh, and within technology, picking a spot, which was mature technology companies, companies operating at scale, uh, where other investors weren't focused. So you had uh, a, your, a territory to yourself. Uh, and then if you were successful, you could occupy the commanding heights of that segment because you had pioneered that. It was kind of, I think, big point number one. I think big point number two was uh, bringing, instilling a set of investment disciplines, uh, due diligence rigor, uh, and uh, internal processes at Silver Lake that made the investments good ones was very important. You recall that when we started the firm, uh, we raised the largest first-time fund ever and didn't invest a dollar for a year and a half. Um, and people thought, what are you doing? That was during the period of 2000 and 2001 when you really needed to pick your spots very carefully. So being a disciplined investor uh, in the right asset category at the right time. All right, and finally, Glenn, uh, last question. Uh, the show's called Influencers, and you're an influencer. So my question is, how do you want to use your influence on the world? That's a big question, Andy. So, um, I've, so when I was growing up, uh, when my mother would be baking cookies. Uh, this is in, good. In the, uh, in the, in the kitchen and you'd smell the chocolate chip cookies going. Uh, we always knew as kids that it wasn't for us, it was for the church bake sale, <laughs> right? Um, mom, she always had to put a few aside for us. She was right. a great mom, but my point right. is, uh, yeah. the, uh, my parents were always engaged. My father spent his entire career addressing issues of hunger and poverty, both in the United States and around the world. I think, I, I believe very strongly in the view that um, to whom much is given, from whom much is given, much is expected. Uh, I think I've had the opportunity in my life right now to make important contributions. Uh, and as I say, uh, what we're focused on uh, is um, race relations in the United States uh, and effective public policy. You know, I've recently become co-chair of the Brookings Institution, trying to focus on, uh, well, with my co-chair there, Suzanne Nora Johnson, making it an important, uh, an even more important player in evidence-based independent policy making in Washington. That's a real opportunity uh, to make an important contribution. But mostly it's all finding a place where we can use the great good fortune I've had for good effect for people who are less fortunate than us uh, and for our country in general, which is in real need of leadership today. All right, let's leave it at that. I wanna thank you, Glenn Hutchins, policy wonk, investor, thinker. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Andy Serwer. Thank you for watching Influencers with Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.